Greetings and God bless you in the wonderful name of our living Lord and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is Bob Hagen. This is As He Leads on the Uptime Community Station here at Uptime.Church. Uh, we have uh, many resources on there, a lot of teachings if you want to go there. Uh, usually meet on Tuesday nights at uh, 8.30 Eastern for a, uh, a live discussion. It's always It's always wonderful and there's always a lot of word spoken as that's what we're all about here we want to get into the word of god and talk a little bit about the lord jesus christ because the word is the word of god is all about him and the peace that we have now is the title of this teaching um, knowing that jesus christ is a prince of peace and just to go into his word and go into god's word and to show you some some places and some uh scriptures quite a few scriptures uh, that will support this and what we're going to do is we're going to start off in isaiah chapter 61 and we're going to read the first three verses of isaiah 61 i'm going to explain a little bit here isaiah 61 the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, <clears throat> to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. This is a, a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he, uh, in the book of Luke, picks up the scroll and he says these, he speaks these words, the first, uh, the first verse there, 61.1, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But then he stops there. He does not say the day of vengeance of our God, because that's future. It has not happened yet. Okay. okay, he did. He preached. Okay, that's. I just want to show you this. He preached good tidings unto the me. That's number one. To bind up the brokenhearted, which we know is <clears throat> there are many people in the world that are brokenhearted for various and different reasons. Proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the prison to them that are bound. Okay, proclaiming liberty to the captives. And that's just not talking about people that are in prison. That's talking about cap captive in your minds, uh, slaves to different things that are that are morally wrong, um, just bound with addictions. You know, there's many kinds of addictions. I'm not going to go down the whole list of them, but there's a myriad of them out there. And, you can go on the internet and you can, all you have to do is type in addictions and page after page of them. Um, opening of the prison to them that are bound. Prisons can be uh, a bars or they can be mental. Uh, Jesus Christ came and what does it say right there after um, his prophecy of him, after the Lord's anointed him to preach good tidings unto the meek. Okay, what are the good tidings? That's the word of God, the word of truth. And we're going to see as we go along that he has brought us peace. Let's go to, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go to John chapter 14 and verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Okay, I'll take a look at that for a second here. Peace I leave with you. Okay, Jesus Christ speaking. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Okay, what does the world do? The world gives, the world takes back. You know, there's strings, you know. Kind of reminds me of this whole thing with, uh, you know, we pray for the folks that have lost everything, loved ones, homes, and property, and everything else that went on with these terrible hurricanes that have come up, you know, Helene and... Uh, this other one that just happened, um, name of it right now for some reason escapes me, but it was a bad one. And a lot of people lost homes and everything, but, you know, did they have peace? No, they didn't have peace. 
And also another thing about it is what are they going to do? You know, if they don't have, you know, when you've lost everything like that, if you have a faith, you're able to go on and you can rebuild. And I'm sure many of these folks are with family members and there's been a great outpouring of support from various organizations, Samaritan's Purse and uh, God's Pit Crew out of Virginia and a lot of other ones. But, you know, to, to be able to read this and know that our hearts are not to be troubled, neither are we to be afraid because of what Jesus Christ accomplished. We'll see that as we go along here. Okay, now we're going to go to uh, John chapter 16. And we'll look at, at verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Okay. We can all attest to this. We all know this happens. The world, there's mental pressure. There's tribulation. There's stuff that happens that is uh, difficult. There are challenges that we have with our families, that our loved ones. Whether that's illness or accidents they've been in or whatever. But God's word says here, Jesus, that, you know, these things I've spoken to you, you might have peace. And peace is a great word because that's the end of enmity with God. You know, we were at one point we were enemies of God. Now we're no longer enemies of God. This is really great. But he says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Okay. John chapter 20 and verse 19. Kind of. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus, stood in the midst, said unto them, How come you guys are hiding? I just got up from the dead. What's wrong? Why are you afraid? No. First thing he said unto them was, Peace be unto you. They were, they were assembled behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. Okay. Because they, they were already marked men because of their association with Jesus. They walk with Jesus. Now Jesus is crucified and they, they're they afraid that they're going to come for them next. You can read into that if you want. That's what I'm projecting right now because that's exactly the way they felt. But he comes in and says, peace be unto you. you can you imagine that must have just lowered the anxiety level in that room <laughs> a little bit? Hey, he's there. Peace. This is great. I don't have to be afraid anymore. Okay, now we're going to proceed up to uh, the book of Acts. We're going we're gonna to look at this, Acts 10, verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. This is just a quick scripture here that's preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He came that we might have life and that we may have it, might have it more abundantly, John 10, 10. He says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes in the Father except by me. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There's not 14 million different ways to get to God. You know, you're, I'm a good man, so I'm going to heaven. You hear this all the time, you know, that so-and-so has passed away. Well, they're all looking down now and are all, you know, if they're not born again in the Spirit of God, they're not. Sorry to burst your bubble there, but they're not. And this is so important to know that peace is available. Years ago, when I was involved in Buddhism, I one of the th goals that they had was world peace. And you hear that many times on the network. And, you know, we're, we're striving. Why can't we just have world peace? At some point in time in the future, a man will come along. He will say, hey, I can bring peace to the entire world. That will happen future, but it's not going to be, it's going to be a fake, it's going to be false until the Lord returns. <clears throat> okay, now let's uh, go to Acts chapter 18, please. <clears throat> it's kind of an interesting little section here, verses 8 through 11. And Crispus, love that name, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord. Now, wait a second now. Hmm. 
Get that now. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with what? All his house. I'll tell you a little something about Eastern culture that I've learned because the Bible is an Eastern book. When the head of a household believed, like Cornelius in uh, Acts chapter 10, when the head of a household believed, the whole household believed. The man of the house said, I'm believing on the Lord. His, his son's daughter's wife, extended family would look to him and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. They weren't forced to do it. It's just the, out of respect and out of realizing that he was doing what was best for the family. This is kind of a neat thing when you look at these things in the word of God. Believed on the Lord of all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid. Okay. Okay. Paul had a little bit of fear maybe. He, he must have. Because the first thing he gets in the vision is be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Okay, so the revelation he got was, don't be afraid. Go out and speak. Go stand, speak in the temple. The people, all the words of this life. Hold not your peace. Go out. And he did. Okay. It's a promise. I'm going to do it. And he he carried out what he was instructed to do. But it's just, it's great because you see in, the, in verse 8 that a chief ruler of the synagogue, which is where people should have been going for help, and they, they did, but they were always, all this religion stuff was going on. Christmas heard the word and he said, I believe that. That's great. I bring my house together, you know, my family, and I want them to hear this. And it, there was just, it was a, uh, if you will, a revival in the town there. How would you like to have that in your town? To where you go into church Sunday morning. And man's up there, speaks, and all of a sudden, everybody in there beliefs and they bring their families in and they're you know the town wants to hear it and it changes it completely changes the atmosphere of a town it's fantastic i just thought i'd throw that one in because that that little segment right the session right there shows or segment of the war excuse me shows that the lord doesn't want us to be afraid but to speak his word with truth and love okay romans chapter five Roaming on over to Romans. Therefore, being justified by works, being justified by uh, saying Hail Marys every day or going to confession every day or whatever. Now it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a promise. We have peace with God. We're justified, justified, just as if I'd never sinned by faith, you know. That believing in what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished. It's not, we're not saved by works. We all know that. You know, we're, if, we, if it were works related, uh, there are many people that can brag about having done more for the Lord or say, well, look, I've had a ministry for 50 years and I've led uh, several million people to Christ. For one thing, if you've had a ministry that long, God bless you. But you know what? The Lord is the one that adds to the church. You know, Apollos, you know, I have planted, Apollos has watered. God gives the increase. So anybody that hears the word of God via any thing that's here on uptime, if they come to a knowledge of the truth, it's because the Lord has opened their heart. That's, that's the truth of the matter, you know. And we're thrilled when we hear it, too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we're excited every time we hear that somebody has turned to the Lord, like the prodigal. They said, you know, I'm going home to dad. He'll be there. I'm just going to be a servant and I'll be happy. But his dad says, no, that's not going to work out. You're my son. I'm waiting for you and I'm going to run to you when I see you. Wow. Great stuff. Okay. <laughs> Romans chapter eight. And verse six, here's a, here's a beauty. 
For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. In God's word, when you become a son of God, you know, you still have the same mind. Your mind does not all of a sudden become 100% of the time spiritual, and it's going to be inclined to nothing but the will of the Lord. It doesn't work that way. When you're born again, you still have the same mind, and the word of God talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that we're to renew our minds. It talks in the epistles about how we have the mind of Christ, but we have to, although our body is perishing, the outward body daily, that we can re we can put on the new man by putting on the words that are in God's word and endeavoring to walk with him according to the truth of his word. Spiritually minded is life and peace. But a question for you, wouldn't, like, wouldn't you like life and peace? I do. I believe most people do. They want peace. They want they want to have their lives blessed. You know, they're not out there. Majority of the people aren't greedy trying to get so much that they can brag about how much they have or how big a house they have or all the fancy cars that they own. And all that. Sometimes I watch this stuff on TV about all the materialism that goes on. And it's just why do they need all that? You know, if you have a roof over your head and you have meals and you have a comfortable place to live and you're safe and your family's safe and well, you should be blessed. Be thankful for what you have. Okay, now uh, Romans 10. Romans 10. And you can go back a, a couple of verses and you can find out if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe God raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved and it's a really fantastic chapter to go back and read. In verse 15, and how shall they preach except they be sent? Okay. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So if you're a minister of the gospel and you're out there sharing God's word with people, the word of God says you have beautiful feet. Okay. Look down at your feet and you go, I don't know. My feet aren't that beautiful. The word of God says they are. You're, you know, you're preaching the gospel of peace. You're making it available for people to realize that there is an alternative to this crazy world that we live in. And uh, let me just add this. It's not religion. You know, Jesus did not come to make religion. He, he, he was, he followed the Old Testament, he fulfilled the law, but he came for a new way of life. He came to give us a new way of life. The adversary, all through the word of God from the very beginning in Genesis, tried to kill, you know, tried to destroy the bloodline because God said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to fix this. You know, there's going to be enmity between enmity between the seeds here. You know, it was talking about the very beginning in Genesis. The seed was going to have to be the redeemer, and through the Old Testament, many times it was very close to the line of believers, the line of Christ being destroyed. But it it did not happen, as we know. He was he came. He was born and lived life as a man and he was you know laid down his life for us god raised him from the dead but he had to he had to always do the will of the father and i don't think that he was really looking forward to being uh beaten being spat upon um nailed to a tree and having people revile and rebuke him but he did that all for you and me Pretty fantastic savior that we have. Romans chapter 14, please. <laughs> For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay. Kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not these big fancy banquets that, you know, where money's no object and everybody's eating and drinking and carrying on and all that stuff, but it says righteousness 
which is right living, and peace, when it's again that word peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And the great thing about the New Testament period in which we live in, under the new covenant, is that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. After the day of Pentecost, it was available to have that Holy Spirit residing within. It's not being pulled out four times a week. You know, so I got to get born again again. You know, I got to, I sinned. I have to go confess my sins so I can be, you know, cleansed of them so I can go on tomorrow. We, we, if we're out of fellowship and we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Talks about in first John, you know, it's, um, the gift that we've been given is so great. It, it's, it's hard to put words to it. It's by grace that we're saved. But the power that he's given us is to not only have a life that we can say is more than abundant, but also to reach out to other people and help them. Because the word of God says we're ministers of the New Testament. He says we've been ordained to go and speak his word. I haven't gone to a Bible college. I don't have a certificate that says I'm I'm ordained as far as a seminary goes in this country. But the word of God says I am, so that's good enough for me. Okay, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians now. Thank you. 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell, farewell. How many people say farewell now? Be perfect. Okay. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Look at that verse for a second there. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. How, how many people can you get together and they can actually be of one mind? Uh, or be of good comfort. The word says be perfect. Okay, that's impossible. Well, spiritually we are. Be perfect. I, I look at this. Be perfectly aligned one with another. You know, if your goal is to have an opportunity to go out and witness to the community, you say you get together on a Saturday and say we're all going to go out and we're just going to walk through the town and we're going to let people know about the love of God through what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished. Let's just do that. You're all of one mind when you're doing that. And it says the God of love and peace shall be with you. Do you think God's going to abandon us, you know, when we're when we're out there doing that? And not just those things, our our daily lives, the things that we we deal with. Our families are important. We pray for our families. We pray for one another. You know, that's one of the things that that's it's it's so important that we do. Um there's been many things going on lately, and I'm not going to go down and list stuff, but but we've been praying an awful lot lately, all of us, and and uh, it seems like there's always things coming up. But you know the great thing about that? When you pray, it transcends the miles. You know? uh, I live in Minnesota. Greg lives in New York. Yet we're able to do this. This is fantastic. You know, and, and it's not... It's not that I do this or that we do this so that men can pull, pull, pull us up on a pedestal and see, well, I wish I could do what those guys did. Look at how great they are. Well, it doesn't not matter. The message is what matters, not the messenger. You know, somebody comes on and they speak God's word. They're doing it because they love the Lord Jesus Christ and they want people to believe and what he's accomplished and what he's what he can do in their lives. Good example of that is my brother John Fortier and Watchdog Studies. I love John because he's he just he's just John. He just holds it forth. And it's the word of God going out and it's it's blessing people when it goes out. Okay. Galatians chapter one. Galatians one three. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, once again, the word peace is used in these salutations. Uh, it, it's a big deal. We are at 
enmity with God. Okay, we're, we're without God and without hope in this world. But then a knowledge of the truth came along. Somebody told me years ago about the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I wanted to find out about this man. I wanted to see if this was really true. So I checked out a fellowship, thankfully. I wasn't coerced into believing it. I wasn't forced to believe that Jesus Christ was the way, truth, and the life. You know, I was shown by God's word. I was shown. They said, here, you take it. You be a good Berean, to quote my brother Michael Pels. Being a good Berean, you do it. You study it. You let God work in your heart and teach you. And you'll see. He'll teach you. Okay, now uh, Galatians 5, 22. And we've all heard this one, haven't we? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And we can, well, we, we can stop right there. Just because, right, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay, these are all like a clump of grapes from living a spiritual life, from being in fellowship with, with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You can have a life that has love, that has joy, peace. You can be gentle, goodness, faith. It's just, there's these are very positive things that you can have in your life. And there's times when we need all of them. You know, uh, when things are unsettled and when there's a lot of anxiety, what do we need? We need peace. We also need to be able to realize there's going to be some long suffering going on here. We're going to have to realize that there's going to have to be some patience, you know, and the Lord will give you patience and he will give you comfort. He does not have a shortage of comfort. He doesn't have this, this meter that says, okay, today I'm running out of comfort. So you're going to have to come back to me tomorrow. No, he has comfort when you need it. He's the God of all comfort. Okay. In essence, then he's the God of all love and all, all joy and all peace, right? And this is available not by anything we've done, but it's a gift. It's by grace. It's, it's, this is great. This is fantastic stuff. Okay. Okay, I've got down here um, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Um I wrote a little note down here. He is our peace. The word is Irene. I, it's E-I-R-E-N-E. -E. Absolute end of enmity is what that word means. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Wow. We can stop right there, right? No. And if children, then heirs. heirs okay. And what is an heir? Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. The word of God says right here in verse 17 that we're heirs of God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and joint heirs with Christ. Does that make us special? Does that make us somebody? Yes. It says we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. Okay, in Peter, heirs of God. Okay. When we go to pray to the Lord, just for instance, Lord, I need you today. I got things in my life that I'm having difficulty with. You know what they are. I just thank you for working in my life, for helping me to understand these things and to giving me the peace that you've promised because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished. And I thank you. And in his name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for these things. Amen. It says we can come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need. So when you say that prayer, are you doing anything that's sin by going to the Father and saying, I need you? No. He wants us to do that. He it says the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. But he also wants us to acknowledge that he's the one that is our sufficiency. 
And we're being thankful to him because of that. Not that he's, God is not an ATM. We put a card in, you, know, you get 300 bucks. Here, sh 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 put your pin in and here comes the money out. No, he's a loving father. He's like the forgiving father in Luke. The son goes off and does his own thing. And then, you know, he comes back and he all he wants to be is part of the family. Even if it's a distant part of the family, the father says, no way. I, you're my son. You've been dead, but now you're alive. You're back. We're thrilled you're back. That's the way God looks at each and every person when they get saved. He is waiting, folks, at the end of the road. And he is not going to send a servant out to meet you. He's going to go and he's going to meet you himself. He does that with each and every person when they believe on him. He's, he doesn't, he's not a stranger any longer to us. You know, he says all of a sudden, all these years of your life, you've really, it's, it's just, you know, God has been some religious thing you invoke. But all of a sudden it's personal. You've heard the term having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what it is because that's what he wants. And it, this, is, this is not me making this up. This, this has been the word of God for a long, long time. It stood the test of time. People have gone after it. They've tried to discount it. They've tried to change it. There's, there's translations out there that, that turn my stomach when I read them. They're so off, and they're just absurd what they do. But these right here, if you know words, you can get a dictionary and look up the word air and look up the word join air, and it's a big deal. And Paul does not flippantly throw these things around just to fill a page either. He said, well, it would sound good if the book, if the uh, letter to the Romans had heirs and join heirs with Christ. Let's we'll put that in. I'll make everybody feel good, at least for today. If he wasn't given the revelation to write that, he wouldn't have written it. Okay. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Sometimes I get a little wound up about this stuff. I can't help it because this is God's word and this is the truth. And... I really feel it's important, especially now with the time the way it is and things going the way they are in this crazy world we live in, that we're getting close to the rapture, the pre-trib rapture. I really believe it's getting very, very close. I don't say that a lot of times when I do a teaching on here, but I really feel in my heart right now it's atmospheric. Something, something's changed huge lately. Ephesians 2, 14 through 17, for he is our peace, Jesus Christ, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the law, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, Jew and Gentile, making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came, and what did he do? He preached division to you. Who are, He preached, if you don't follow this religion, that off with your head. No. It says, he came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. Okay. We made it in there. We, we weren't promised. If you go through the Old Testament, the Gentiles weren't promised a whole lot. <laughs> they weren't. It was a mystery, you know. The adversary didn't know it. He said, Oh, Jesus will live and we'll, you know, we'll we'll have him killed and that'll be the end of him. But what was the ace up the sleeve of God? The resurrection. That day of Pentecost, giving of the Holy Spirit. And then he went drats, drats, and double drats. You know, I, I blew it. I shouldn't have done that. I should have let him live. But now anybody who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ can be in, you know, indwelled with the Holy Spirit, that token, that down payment, and walk around and be witnesses for him. Kind of neat stuff, isn't it? Okay, um, Ephesians 4, verse 3. We're kind of getting toward the end here. Endeavoring to keep 
the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. It doesn't say it's always going to happen, but we're to endeavor to do it. Um, unity of the spirit, uh, when we're on doing the uh, uptime on Tuesday nights, we're endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We're not on there trying to outdo one another. Uh, if you've ever watched, it's a uh, unity that we have because we're all interested in people coming to a knowledge of the truth. You know. Philippians 4, 7, and 8. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And you just can put, you know, the word of God is true and honest and just and pure and lovely and good report. It's virtuous and there's praise. Our lives can... If you plug your life into that and you're dealing with struggles mentally, there, there's different things that are going on. You can say, okay, is that thought I had, is that a true thought or is that an honest or a pure thought? No, kick it out. Does it run against what God's word says that I should do? Yeah, it does. Well, but this time I'll, you know, just this one time. Now, just the one time ends up being a problem. You know, or it doesn't matter, or it's no big deal. <laughs> Every time you tell yourself something that you're feeling funny about is no big deal, it is a huge deal. And you should kind of run it through this filter of these two verses, because the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He'll keep your hearts and your mind. What, you know, what God has given you, God never designed the mind to be a holding house for negative garbage. You know, the mind was designed for the word of God. You know, and the battlefield is the mind. The weapon is the word. And the key is faithfulness. Whose faithfulness is the key? Our faithfulness, not always. We endeavor to be faithful to God. We should every day. But God's the one that's faithful. And He's He doesn't change. So if we put on the word, it's a battle. We know it. When we need his strength, he's going to be there for us. And he's closer than your next breath. He's not going to cop out and say, well, you know, I've, I've really had it with Bob this week. He's been praying too much. Why can't he get over these things? You know, the word of God says I'm a son of God. The word of God says I'm a joint heir with Christ. He doesn't look at me like that. You know, when he sees you, he sees the best in you. He sees you with Christ in you, with your personality, your strengths, the things that other people in the body of Christ need. You know, when I'm on with the guys on Tuesday night, I need their strengths. I, I need to, to learn, you know, from them. I need to learn from other people, you know. I'm not, I'm not a young guy anymore, but I'm still learning a lot of stuff. Kevin will always jump in and say, sure, you know, I'm the elder statesman. But I don't know about being a statesman, but I'm always learning stuff. It's kind of great. And uh, I want to share just two more verses with you all. Um, Colossians 1.20. So, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and Colossians 3.15, be our final verse. Uh, I'll give you an assignment right at the end of this one for you to do in your, in your own time. It'll really bless you when you read it, but... This is my prayer for you. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The word rule means to umpire. Ball, strike one. Ball, 
You know, you've been watching the baseball playoffs. Let the peace of God umpire in your hearts, rule in your hearts, to the which you are called in one body, and be thankful. My prayer is that you let the peace of God rule in your hearts. If you get born again of God's spirit, you can allow his peace to rule in your hearts and be thankful. You know, if there's something that comes up that's not, you know, I had a headache this morning. I'm, I'm thankful I can breathe this morning. I'm thankful that I'm feeling better this morning. Um, but I want, I, I want to allow the peace of God to rule in my heart. You've heard of that verse in, uh, it's in Psalm 51. David says, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was upon them at certain times. It wasn't always, it was not in them. It was upon them. But create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, is a prayer that I do daily. There's nothing wrong with saying that. There's nothing wrong with praying that God would create in you a clean heart. And where there's areas of your heart that maybe you're having difficulty with because of past problems that you've had, that you can thank him for that, for creating in you, you know, and making you see how much he loves you and how much he cares for you. Okay. All right, my assignment for, for the next time we get together, a couple of weeks, is to read Luke chapter 24 and read the entire chapter. And when you read that, just put yourself in the position of being one of those two guys that's walking to Emmaus. You know, Greg and I are heading down to, you know, we're heading out to the beach. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus. You know, we don't know. He's all right, you know. And just... When you read that record and when you think about how personal and how the Lord Jesus Christ is not, you know, he's interested in the individual. He's interested in you and me. He's interested in two guys walking that he can open the scripture to. And then they say in the one verse, did not our hearts burn within us? As he opened to us the scriptures, as the scriptures start to open to you, and as you go to the Lord and you ask him, hey, you know, I need to, can you teach me? I don't know anything about your word. I'm going to start getting in. I want you to show me why I, really, why I should believe this. And there's nothing wrong with asking him, hey, you know, why should I believe this? I've been an atheist all my life. Why should I believe this? I'm a Buddhist. Just take an opportunity to get into God's word and I've said this at least a few times. Give Jesus Christ a chance, please. He's there. He's, he's not going anywhere. He's there for you, and he's waiting. He's like waiting at the end of the road there for you to say, yeah, it's time for me to go home. Thank you for joining me today. Um, my prayer is the Lord will bless you. If you don't know him, check it out because you'll be pleased that you have done that. He's not going to force you, but he's going to gently entreat you and he will teach you and your life will never be the same. So I thank you. Um, have a wonderful day. Be blessed. And uh, once again, very grateful for Greg, uh, being here with me today to uh, do this program, and uh, I'll see you down on down the road somewhere, another or in the air. God bless. Have a great day. Peace.